I was invited to join a retinue at the annual reenactment of the Battle of Tewkesbury. With this deadline to spur me on, I was keen to get my armour to a wearable stage. Ooh, I hope that's enough hammers. Aware that I was still having issues with it, Dave Hewitt, my armourer, kindly invited me to his workshop for a day of sorting things out, and I gladly grabbed the opportunity. I managed to get the armour into these two large wheeled bits of luggage, and then somehow onto a train. Dave reckoned that this might once have been used to make spitfires. Dave agreed that the hort pieces on the pauldrons weren't working, so one task was to remove them. I'd just have to do without them, even if it would make me look less like Arthur from Excalibur. This was a slightly bigger task than I had realised, because the top lame of the pauldrons had to be removed from the assembly to gain access to the inside of the rivets to drill them out, but soon enough the hort pieces were removed. Here you see one abandoned in a vice. And the rivet holes filled with rivets that each did nothing but fill a hole. The pauldrons were reassembled, given a buffing, and it was on to the next thing. Here are someone else's rather pretty pauldrons waiting for him. As soon as Dave saw the sabatons worn with the greaves, he concluded that something would have to be done to close the rather large gap between them, and this would be done by replacing the top lames with much larger ones. From his collection of paper patterns, he picked out something suitable and traced it onto a sheet of steel. These new pieces would then fit with the heel plates that he'd already started on before I got there. Here you see a sabaton with its strap removed, waiting to have a new back put on it. With his great experience, he was able to adapt the pattern on the fly. His new apprentice then cut the shapes out and got to work on them. Several different cutting tools were used. On the battlefield, you wouldn't want to run into a foe armed with one of these. Jagged and imprecise edges were taken off with a sander. A slight central ridge was added with this tool, which is also used for fluting. Whack it in the heat and then beat it with a soft hammer over a stout cylinder to get it round. By some cunning, which I didn't fully understand, a subtle curve in a different direction was also introduced. I think he's drilled holes there before. The pieces were then fitted to each other, then fitted with the greave on my booted foot, and then more adjustments made. The hinge was added on one side. Note how annoying it is to peen a rivet in a small space which stops you from swinging the hammer properly. A rectangular recess was then cut out of the heel plate to take the thickness of the hinge. Spring clips for holding the sabatons closed needed to be added as well as bars across the heels to hold the boots in, and there wasn't quite enough time in the day for that, so my foot armour would be posted to me soon after. A pelaine, knee, or possibly cooter, elbow, waiting for its day there. Another new calendar, with pictures taken here. This machine, which presses that die into that receiver, was set up to make these things. These have been used in Bohurt medieval battles, and this one has needed several repairs, while this one is so badly cracked it needs replacing. I wonder if that sport is dangerous. Next, Rera braces, aka upper cannons of Van Brace, aka bicep protectors. Again, a start had been made and a basic shape cut out and put through a roller to curl it. There was a decision to be made here, to rivet or not to rivet. A riveted rower brace is a lot more solid and strong, but were I to become unexpectedly muscular in that area, it would not be adjustable. I opted for riveted, and we had to guess how much room to leave in them for the mail on my sleeves. They might be a bit tight, but you don't want them to flop about. Every now and then they have a grand disentangle of the power tools. Rivets in a box of what looks like soil. Apparently it's stuff that comes off the buffing and grinding wheels. An armourer's hammer, that is what these are called. Stout leather was then marked out and cut for the fixings. Through holes in these I would lace, or point, the rera braces to my arming doublet beneath. Here you see the early stage of a van brace. 
These straight lines of indentation have been put in with that tool I showed you earlier. Then on this one they have been widened, then the whole thing will be heated up and curved around and those lines will become the spiral barley corn pattern that you get on a lot of English armours. It was a good job that I did bring everything because only when you see the pieces together do you pick up on some little glitches. One of my pauldrons didn't sit right on the cuirass and so with some cold hammering the back was reshaped to compensate. There was some asymmetry involved but I couldn't tell you how much of it was in the armour and how much of it was in my own body. I tried out the pauldron with my newly altered back and looked a bit silly. To attach a strip of leather inside the helmet, which would enable me to add a proper liner, one option would have been to remove the visor with its big rivets, then remove the brow reinforcement, then hide the rivets holding the leather in place under the brow reinforcement and then reassemble everything. Much simpler was to leave the visor in place and drill through the reinforcer and main skull of the helmet in one go. How then should it be riveted? Many authentic helmets have an unapologetic line of visible rivets. Other helmets make a big feature of the rivets and get fancy with them. Here Dave opted for trying to hide the rivets by hammering them flush and then buffing away. Old Faithful. Perhaps more impressive than the roughness of its construction is the amount of wear on the face of this hammer. That would take quite a few hammer strokes. Now you may find it strange, as I did, uh, that the leather strip hangs downwards from the rivets rather than being aligned the other way around. This is so that the strip can fold back on itself and cover the heads of the rivets and form a more comfy brow pad. They knew exactly how much to snip off a rivet so that it ended up being flush after peening. A bit of grinding got us this far and then some buffing. We're seeing sparks there, which I didn't expect. And that got us to here. I then put it all on and tried it out. I couldn't move the fingers because the gloves weren't attached to the gauntlets, but otherwise it seemed to be moving pretty well. It wouldn't do that. It just hit me in the face. Some straps. The thing we got there, yeah. No. Yes. Sorry. I. <laughs> I was sort of waiting for you to be honest. Uh. And now dear gentle viewers we come to the sad sad tale of what happened to the front of my cuirass. This is the front, known as the front, and the back of the cuirass is known as the back. And you put the two together and they're known as the back and breast. Uh, the front is the breastplate, which in this case is riveted solidly to the placket, which is the bottom bit, uh, the, well the middle bit I suppose, and then this articulated bit at the bottom is called the fold. Um, now, uh, I went into the fight at Tewkesbury Having heard a warning from not just one, but two or three people had said, Lloyd, do be aware, you are a shiny. Now, a shiny is someone who's walking out there for the first time resplendent in his brand new, extremely expensive, shiny, pristine armour, head to foot in gleaming metal. Now, in a group, any group of people that's uh, quite large, there will be gits. 
Reenactors are, on the whole, wonderful folk, of course, but there were 2,000, 2,000 people reenacting the Battle of Tewkesbury that day, and in any group that big, you would imagine that there will be just, you know, one or two gits. And I had been warned that shinies are magnets for gits. Um, now, most people, seeing a wonderful piece of armour, and they have a hobby where they you know, really uh, you know, adore that sort of thing and, and respect it, they go, oh, wow, hasn't that guy got a beautiful suit of armour? I better be you know, perhaps even more gentle with him than I might otherwise be, because it would be a crime to spoil something as magnificent as that. Whereas the git thinks to himself, ooh, that's pretty. I bet he's really proud of that. I think I should take him down a peg or two. I'm going to dent it. And then he dents the armour. Now, uh, I must have fought, I don't know, 30 people, something like that, at uh, Tewkesbury, and 29 of them were absolutely fine. And yes, yes, possibly their hits gave me a tiny scratch here and there. But as a scratch, I can accept it. I wouldn't go into battle uh, thinking that I would get away without even a scratch. Um, but this is a socking big dent, and it is a big problem. Now then, how did it happen? Well, uh, I was standing in the front line. Uh, this was on the on the Saturday, on the first of the two days, and I was doing what I was supposed to do, thrusting at waist height, and we're all gently. Oh, yeah, you got me. Oh, I got you. Oh, uh, oh nearly. And oh, I uh, got you. Got you. Yeah, we were doing all that. Everyone was just amiably bopping each other. You see, this was a reenactment. It was a public display. We were supposed to stick to a script, and the script said that the Lancastrian fiends came up to the stout yeoman of York, and uh, then everyone fought for a bit, and then the Lancastrians pulled back to regroup. And this is what happened. And hilariously, or ridiculously, or possibly realistically, depending on how you look at it, there wasn't a single casualty on either side. No one was taking hits, because we were sticking to the script, and we weren't, there wasn't meant to be carnage at this point. Anyway, um, someone put so much force into this hit that I was, uh, much to my surprise, suddenly jolted back physically by about eight inches, and I remember that a certain amount of <laughs> came out of me involuntarily. Um, and uh, oh, I should say that the armour did its job, and I was not at all injured. It wasn't even hurt. There was no pain involved, at no physical pain involved at all. But straight away I was thinking, I hope that kid hasn't just put a socking great big dent in my armour, because that's going to be really annoying. I couldn't see, though, because I had my visor on, uh, and besides, the dent is actually below the peak of the curvature uh, on the, uh, on the uh, placket, so even if I could look down, I wouldn't have been able to see it. Um, you're not, because it's riveted, there's no flexibility in this, so you're, you're, you know, if I were to lean forward, my whole body would get... I couldn't see. Anyway, um, but there was the mental thought of, if he's dented my armour, that's... Oh, what a git! Uh, anyway, he had. Um, now, I uh, went on a forum on uh, the interweb and uh, talked about this, and uh, people were offering advice on how to repair it and the like, and someone made the absolutely reasonable point that I suppose someone had to make, was, oh, well, it, you know, it could have been an accident. And I accept that, yes, it could have been an accident. However, I would put the probability of that accident at a tiny fraction of 1%. I am 99.7128% sure that this was deliberate. Um, one of the suggestions was, oh, well, um, uh, maybe you hadn't been taking your hits, so he thought he had to hit you a little bit harder in order for you to, to, to understand that you've just been hit. Well... As I've already said, no one was taking hits. Uh, yes, I did take uh, a few hits. That is to say, I was hit a few times. And no, I didn't go down screaming in agony. But then I was playing the part of someone who was wearing a suit of armour who could perhaps take a few hits and not die. And I was dishing out plenty of hits as well. I would say noticeably more than I was, I was taking. Don't mean to boast, but I think that's true. Uh, and absolutely no one I hit took their hits. They weren't supposed to. It, it wasn't a competitive sport. But then suddenly... <laughs> Oh, wow! This came out of the blue. So, no, that doesn't really work um, as an explanation. And even if it did work as an explanation, it's not an excuse to hit someone this hard. I've, we, I mean, we've all been annoyed when we are fighting competitively in reenactment and someone's not taking his hits. And we've all perhaps just pushed a little bit harder. So he ignored that one. He ignored that one. So I'll put my spear tip on him and give him a little push. That's definitely a hit. You can't ignore that, right? But I don't go, wham! That's not excusable. Um, anyway, so uh, I, I went, 
back. Oh, someone that sells said, oh, well, it could have been a surge. Could have been a surge. Um, maybe they, 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 he was pushed involuntarily from behind. Uh, I suppose that could happen, but it didn't. There was no surge in there. Their formation was only two ranks deep, and there wasn't a surge. And besides, um, these people were all on the front foot, all reaching, reaching constantly and rather top heavy with their armor, re trying to get their hits in. Um, and if you are suddenly and unexpectedly pushed from behind, um, you don't, if you have the tiniest bit of care for the welfare of anyone in front of you, then go Whoa! with your arms, uh, because th that's going to endanger people. But also, to get your balance back, the first thing you do on being suddenly pushed forwards is you bring your arms in with the heavy weapon, which is taking your centre of gravity quite a bit that way. So actually being pushed from behind has the opposite effect. Um, so no, uh, wasn't that. Um, what else was suggested? Um, uh, push. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe you ran onto it um, and, and didn't realise it. Uh, you, yes, that can happen, only I was standing stationary, so no, it didn't. Besides, humans are very good. Very, very good, in fact, at um, spotting the difference between accidental and deliberate behaviour. If I were to walk up to you and go, BAF! and punch you really hard uh, on the nose and smirk, and then go, uh, oh, uh, no, uh, everyone, uh, my, my hand slipped. It, it was an accident. It was, it was an accident. Do you think anyone would believe me? Maybe if they hadn't seen it happen, maybe one of those would believe me. But would you believe me? No. This guy went, wham! And, yeah, this was not an accident. Uh, anyway, um, I now have a bit of a problem. It's not just that it's dented, it's also got this deep gouge in it, which is going to be very difficult to remove. If I were to grind away at the metal to hide this gouge, the metal would then be so thin that there'd be a dangerous weak spot on the front, and I don't want that. I'm probably going to have to live with a certain amount of scarring on this armour forever. So, do I uh, beat it out cold? Uh, as has been suggested by quite a few people on the internet, and this is something I could do. I don't want to have to go running back to my armor every single time. But my armorer said, "Oh no, this is, this is, um, you know, uh, uh, heat-treated uh, high-carbon steel, and this should really be uh, uh, repaired using heat." And he could probably do a better job than me of, get, of getting rid of the um, of the of the the gouge as well. He might replenish it and and, and disguise it a bit. Um, so, so this is a problem. But uh, you know, so you go on the internet and you try to find out what what do I do? What do I do? And of course, I could go to Wondrium. Like, of course, go to Wondrium, source of so much knowledge. And I typed in the word repair, thinking, well, they're bound to have something on how to bash dents out of a, uh, a dented placket. Um, and uh, almost immediately, uh, I, my, my screen showed that they have a, a course of 41 lectures on uh, the fundamentals of home maintenance. So I thought, oh, well, there's bound to be something on. Did you know there wasn't? There was nothing. There was uh, loads on you know, how to do your own plumbing, how to uh, repair brickwork and electrical, how to re re um, replace a light fitting, install electrical sockets and all that sort of stuff, but nothing, no, I felt, oh, I mean, I've been let down. I mean, I'm wondering normally doesn't, but obviously you go into the rabbit hole and I found something quite interesting about Egyptians, so I thought I had that to watch. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, but if you do have um, uh, interest in just ordinary fundamental things like home maintenance, if you've joined the club of uh, homeowners, hi, uh, then you'll know the joys of just how much work um, keeping a house in repair is, and, and one gym can help you even with things like that. It's not all just academic topics, and uh, so you could go to um, wondrium.com stroke Lindy Beige and find out all this. You could look at the academic courses, but you could go, oh, they've got loads of practical stuff like, like home maintenance as well. And you can do all of this for free. They're my sponsor, by the way. Possibly I should have made that clearer. Um, and uh, yes, because they are putting a, a, a trial uh, offer of, of a, a free trial period to go around the site, watch whatever you want. Um, and if you like it, you can then uh, start paying a subscription and that will renew monthly. And you can then have access to the thousands of lectures they have uh, from lecturers from all around the world. Well, actually, mainly the eastern seaboard of the USA, it's true. But, uh, you know, uh, august bodies, universities and so forth. Now, you might think that, yeah, but surely if these academics are lecturing in, in history, history and geography and science and all that sort of stuff, um, you can't expect the same sort of standards, can you, from someone who's talking about home repairs? Well, <laughs> I'm here to put you right, look at this guy. Look at this guy, you see there, parallel waving. You might think he's going to go, and, yep, 
finger prison. Oh yeah, even when they're doing a home maintenance course, uh, the standards of, of gestures are very high. Because there you go, Wondrium has standards. And I, I thank Wondrium for sponsoring this video. Now then, what am I going to do about this dent? 